Namaste. So now we're going to continue with Vichara Sangraham, right up where we left off, and look into the nature of mind in its original state. Devotee, is self-experience possible for the mind whose nature is constant change? Maharshi, since sattva guna, the constituent of prakriti which makes for purity, intelligence, etc., is the nature of mind, and since the mind is pure and undefiled like space, what is called mind is, in truth, of the nature of knowledge. When it stays in its natural pure state, it has not even the name mind. It is only erroneous knowledge which mistakes one thing for another that is called mind. What was originally the pure sattvic mind of the nature of pure knowledge forgets its knowledge nature on account of nescience, gets transformed into the world under the influence of tamoguna, the constituent of prakriti that makes for dullness, inertness, etc., being under the influence of rajoguna, the constituent of prakriti that makes for activity, passions, etc., imagines I am the body, etc., and the world is real. It acquires the consequent merit and demerit through attachment, aversion, etc., and through the residual impressions, vasanas thereof, attains birth and death. So the nature of mind, in its essence, is pure like space. We talked about space in a previous video. Space is never marked. It's never affected. It always stands aloof from whatever is contained in it. It never gets mixed up with anything. It never gets attached to anything. It's completely slippery. <laughs> Space, although it's required for existence, cannot really be said to exist because it's nothing, simply emptiness. So in the same way, mind in its natural state is pure knowledge, jnana. Huh? This, and we'll see in the next part, uh, this is turiya the fourth state of consciousness. But what happens is mind gets overcome by ignorance, tamoguna. And because of that, it sees the body as the self. It sees the world as real. It sees objects as possessions or things to enjoy and so on. And then because of Rajoguna, the mode of passion, it tries to enjoy them. So this mind is always active, flip-flopping around like a fish out of water, which it really is. It's not in its natural state. So like a fish out of water, it flips and flops this way and that way, but it can never reach a comfortable situation because it's out of its element. And the natural element of the mind is space, akash. So this space can be a place where things show up without judgment, without attachment, 
without a feeling of ownership or the urge to enjoy. Then the mind is in its pure state. Then it sees things as they really are. And this, of course, is the objective of meditation. But the mind that has got rid of its defilement, sin, through action without attachment performed in many past lives, listens to the teaching of scripture from a true guru, reflects on its meaning, and meditates in order to gain the natural state of the mental mode of the form of the self, the form I am Brahman, which is the result of the continued contemplation of Brahman. Thus will be removed the mind's transformation into the world in the aspect of tamoguna and its roving therein in the aspect of rajoguna. When this removal takes place, the mind becomes subtle and unmoving. So right now, for most people, the mind is attached. It's covered by passion and ignorance. See, these are the three factors, attachment, aversion, and ignorance or delusion, that this world is real, this body is myself, these objects are mine, and they are to be enjoyed. So when this delusion, <laughs> this mental disease actually, is removed, only then the mind finds peace. And this is its natural state. When the mind thinks, I am Brahman. Because the mind is always Brahman in past, present, and future. Has never been anything else. Because everything is Brahman. So certainly the mind is also so when we come to this aham brahmasmi, I am Brahman, and we contemplate for a long time due to the merit that we gained in previous lives by many uh, unselfish acts, karma yoga, bhakti yoga. This is called raja yoga. And this is the Vivartavada, the view that the world is illusion. Only Brahman is real. So when we take up this view, then we have the possibility to realize the self. And the self is realized by the mind, which is completely at peace. It is only by the mind that is impure and under the influence of rajas and tamas that reality, the self, which is very subtle and unchanging, cannot be experienced. Just as a piece of fine silk cloth cannot be stitched with a crowbar, or as the details of subtle objects cannot be distinguished by the light of a lamp flame that flickers in the wind. But in the pure mind that has been rendered subtle and unmoving by the meditation described above, the self-bliss, Brahman, will become manifest. As without mind there cannot be experience, it is possible for the purified mind, endowed with the extremely subtle mode, vritti, to experience the self-bliss by remaining in the form of Brahman. Then, that one's self is of the nature of Brahman, will be clearly experienced. This is self-realization. And Ramana Maharshi, in this commentary, is telling us exactly how to attain it. The problem is, 
We don't want to follow his instructions. We don't want to allow the mind to settle on one thought. Aham brahmasmi, uh, or any mantra will do in the beginning. We want the mind to just roam free <laughs> over the objects of the world, become attached to them, and think that they are mine. Well, how can they be mine if there is no I? See, just like when Bodhidharma went to China, he met the emperor, and the emperor was very much distressed because of the mental agitation of being in charge of such a large country. He went to Bodhidharma and said, please show me, what can I do with this mind? What can I do to relieve this anxiety? And Bodhidharma, who's a very large and imposing man, said, meet me at the temple in the morning. I will take care of your mind. <laughs> now, you know, Bodhidharma had just walked over the Himalayas barefoot to get to China. So he was like a force of nature. He was really powerful. So anyway, the next morning, the emperor and Bodhidharma met in the temple courtyard. And Bodhidharma is sitting there with his big staff and his monk hood, you know. And he says, all right, show me your mind. I'll take care of it. You know, Bodhidharma is really weird and scary looking with the big eyes you know, because he cut off his eyelids so he wouldn't sleep during meditation. So the emperor is there, he's searching and searching for his mind, sweating, even though it's in the mountains in the morning, cold, freezing, huh? but he can't find it. He's trying and trying. Finally, when the sun is just coming up, he gets it. And he says to Bodhidharma, there is no mind. I can't find anything. Bodhidharma says, yes, that's the truth. There is no such thing as mind. Mind is a space, a space where things show up. That's consciousness. So consciousness is very subtle. It's not a thing. It's a space. Try to understand. And if you meditate like this, if you consider the mind to be a space of consciousness, a space of awareness, and that various things show up in it, then you won't be attached to those things. You won't mistake, especially, the body for the self. Because the body is just an animal. Huh? It's just a biological machine. Somehow or other, we've become attached to it through karma. But by performing meritorious acts, unselfish acts, unattached to the result, like temple worship, charity, um, digging wells and tanks and, you know, even installing toilets out in villages or whatever, helping the poor, feeding the poor especially. One gains the merit to be able to see this, to be able to rise beyond the modes of passion and ignorance and attain the sattva guna, that which is purer than the others, and to allow the mind to rest in its natural state, which is silence, stillness.
And when the mind has thus been brought under control and is still, one can see that actually I am the self. This is complete self-realization. Aung Tatsat. Aung Shakti Aung.